Folks, we are back. Ow. You ever realize that your pillow is too high up, so you push it away, and then you use your elbow to sleep, and then you wake up, and you can't feel your right side of your jaw? So that's what I'm doing today. But we are here with part four of the composition submission. I'm really excited to get through these last few. This has been such a fun project, and I've really, really enjoyed doing this. I hope to do it again sometime soon. But let's finish these out. We're going to just launch in, and we're starting off today with... Ricky for Music's Melody D. Gioia. Gioia. Something like that. Sorry, Ricky. I'm so sorry. Beautiful! Really nice performance there, Ricky. If that's you playing it, you did an excellent job. Um, it sounded like maybe like you had a melodic idea and you were kind of improvising off of that, which is totally cool, really, really awesome. Your melody itself was great, very, very memorable. Um, you kept it short and you had a nice kind of rhythmic pattern to accompany it, which is very strong. I would say, um, I think that there are some points, if this is an improv, where you're playing two different chords at the same time. So I would take an opportunity, even if you do plan on improvising this, to go ahead and write down your melody, write down the chords that you intend to have on top. Because there's some really great chords happening, but sometimes I'm hearing some clashing chords, like minor on the right hand, and then major in the left hand, or the reverse. Um, and I think that you've got the idea down of what you want to do with this piece, and you just need to kind of articulate it, get it down on paper so you can have that and commit to it. Um, your use of the different textures that the piano can create is excellent. You're really moving around the range in a nice way. Um, I would play with dynamics a little bit. I think there's opportunities for you to kind of have a little bit more dynamic variety. Right now it's very loud, bombastic, and that's cool, especially for climactic sections. But I think you could have a little bit of restraint in some areas. Maybe try playing the melody on its own and just having like singular chords play down as opposed to arpeggios the whole time. Um, that'll make the moments when you really build it up and have those big runs and stuff at the end even more dramatic. But really excellent composition, you did a great job. Your, your performance was solid too, so keep up the great work. Next we have Sasha Arnold's Untitled Piece with a PDF to accompany.
Very, very ambitious. Nice work. Um, that's not easy to do a full orchestral piece, as I'm sure you know. Um, you did an excellent job. You have some really nice orchestrations, particularly in the second half of your piece. Um, you've, you're doing a really nice job playing with those woodwinds. Um, I'm, I'd be curious to know if you're familiar with woodwind writing at all, or woodwind playing, because that in particular was very, very strong. I have a couple, a couple slight comments based on the whole thing. I would like to hear some kind of um, a melody or a theme that can be developed. There's things that are happening in the second half that are great. Ba -da 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 -da. There was things that you were doing sort of like that, woodwind lines that were being repeated, and that was excellent. I think I would have liked to hear that a little bit more in the beginning. And again, this is me just on one listen, so maybe there are motivic things that you're doing that I'm not picking up. But I think some kind of a bold opening statement with a melody that carries itself through would be nice because it would give our ear kind of um, a way to lock into a piece that has so much orchestration. It would be able to carry us on this on this journey. Um, but the way that you're shifting through harmonies, again, in the second half, really, really nice. I would also be aware of the fact that brass, wind players, those kinds of instrumentalists um, need to breathe. And I'm hearing a lot of long, sustained lines, like in the horns, and some of the woodwinds, too. And I would just be aware of where they're going to actually need to breathe, and try and factor that into your writing. Of course, like, good brass players, good wind players, they'll breathe when they need to. They're not going to pass out on the stage. But if we can factor it into our writing in orchestral music, particularly when it's virtual, it makes the whole thing sound a lot more realistic and more idiomatic to the instrument. Same thing goes for range, too. You have a lot of kind of, like big starting points that are very high in the horns, and it can be a little difficult without a warm-up uh, for those horns and some other instruments to just hit the stratosphere right off the bat. So oftentimes we get like melodic lines that lead them up to that moment so that they're not having to just nail a high note right at the beginning. I'd take this for sure if you have any friends who play these instruments, take it to them, see what they think about their specific part, because it'll give you some really great insight into um, orchestration for those particular instruments. But really, really nice work. Loved it. Next, we have Sam Asder's Pink Remix. Now, I can't play remixes on my channel because it's going to get flagged. You know how YouTube is. But if you want to listen to this, um, I've uploaded a SoundCloud link with his track. That way you can check it out. So I'm going to listen to it now, and I'd recommend you go listen to it beforehand. All right. Sweet, Sam. I just had to listen to it. Really, really cool. Again, I recommend you guys listen to it. Left some time so you can click on that link, hopefully, and give it a listen. Um, really, really nice. I like the, uh, the influence of typical like electronic dance music, the way that you've pulled things in. You're doing some cool effects like reverse things with those reverse kicks, which is really nice. You have some nice silences that are going on in between all of the action you have in your remix. I would recommend spending some more time working on the mix itself, because I think there's things in the mix that can be improved a little bit. Um, when your drums come in initially while uh, Katy Perry is singing, it's... Is it Katy Perry? It's Pink, sorry. When, when your drums come in initially when Pink is singing, um, initially it's like a little bit too loud in my opinion. I think it's so loud that I could tell where your remix began and where her song ends. And typically, I think with remixes, you want it to feel integrated in a way that it feels like it could be another version of the song. You know, even if you are taking your own interpretation, the mix elements we want to kind of keep cohesive together. So ways to do that, I would pay attention to the way that they're using reverb in the original track and try and reflect that in yours. Um, your reverb is a little bit more dry, I'm noticing, than the pop song. So like on those snares in particular, you have big, expansive, boom, like big explosive snares with long reverb tails. Not always, of course, but just to kind of fill in the space that you have in your piece. Um, also, I think your kick, it's very punchy, which is nice, but I think it's a little bit, maybe to my ears, too acoustic. It sounds like maybe you took a, a drum kit, kick drum, and reversed that. I would see if whatever your DAW you're using, if it has some electronic-y sounding um, drum kits, because that could work better for this sort of remix style thing. Um, in Logic, it's called Ultra Beat, but there's plenty more out there. I play with that. Um, I like what you're doing with the strings. I like what you're doing with um, the kind of synthy sounds. Again, I think there's mix opportunities. I'm not really hearing any synth bass, and I think that would be a huge addition to this piece to have. 
to accompany kind of those like uh, prominent synths that you have in the in the remix section. Also strings too, I'd push them a little bit farther back because I think what you want to kind of have is like, you want to have like the synths just be this wall and everything else kind of like goes away and then pulls back. Again, that's a matter of automation and volume mixing too, which can be really helpful. Um, but I hear what you're doing, and I hear that you're doing side chain compression and stuff, so when your kick comes in, the song ducks back, and that's awesome, and I would definitely encourage you to keep working with your mix, because I think you'll find the more that you do this sort of thing, you're just gonna, it's just gonna improve more and more, and you've already got a really good intuition for what you're going for. So definitely keep up the great work. Thanks for your submission. Next we have Scott Murray Coors, and he sent a video as well. That was beautiful. Love the way that you play with your rhythm. I love some of those harmonies in there. Oh, I gotta hear that last one again. Oh, what is that? Is that a stacked major chord? I think you did a little stacked major chord in there. You did a G, is that a G in the bottom? D flat major, E flat major stacked on top. That's nice, I like that. I'm gonna steal that. No, I really, really like that. You definitely have a clear sense of what you're going for. Um, I love the progressive jazz feel of it. Kind of reminded me of some of Dave Brubeck's stuff, um, or even uh, Chili Gonzalez. Reminded me of his stuff too a little bit. Um, really excellent. I would love to hear this with like a trio. I think you should notate this if you haven't already. Um, figure out how it's gonna work best. Give some of those bass line stuff to uh, an acoustic bass player or an electric bass player and give it, oh man, like some brushes or something on this, it sounds so nice. I don't have too much to say about this, honestly. I think you've really done a, a great job and you've, you've got a very clear vision for what you're going for, uh, which I think is excellent. You had a nice, your, your motive was really your ba ba bum 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 ba bum 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 and you've used that motive throughout your piece, even at the very end, da -da 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 -da, which is great. It's a really, really great example of how to take a small idea and expand it out large scale. Um, maybe recommendations other than the trio format would be to have a couple movements to this. Maybe make it like some kind of a jazz sonata. That could be really cool. Um, and treat this as like your first movement or even a scherzo movement. I think that could be really cool. Um, but excellent work. Really, really enjoyed it. Thanks for the submission. Next, we have Thales Rudolph with Odyssea. Hopefully I pronounced that right.
right, I'm gonna stop it there. Really nice job. I like your choice of instrumentation, having acoustic guitars mixed with pianos, mixed with kind of these deep drums, kind of gives me a, a Western vibe, actually. Um, something about it has kind of like a frontier -y or bad cowboy sort of feel. I also like how you varied up your drums, so it's not just boom, boom, boom. You've actually done, uh, it sounds like four different hits, or maybe three, so you have like boom, bigger hit, boom, boom like low hit, which is great. And that's a really nice way. I've talked about it in a previous one, a really good way to vary up the drums, keep it interesting. Couple suggestions. Um, I like the melody. I like how you're playing with kind of this feel between stuff that's swung and stuff that's not. I think that's actually really nice. When you get into those low voicings in the piano and the guitar and the strings, um, that, like that low D minor chord, that's a little bit low to use a closed voicing. So that's where I would recommend opening up the voicing. And I know I talk about voicings all the time, but it's a very common thing that a lot of people don't realize they can capitalize on when they start composing or um, improvising, is those voicings. Is when we get below a certain point um, registrally and we start hearing those closed voicings, it can sound a little bit muddy. So what we do is when we get past a certain point, uh, we decide to open it up. And again, I've talked about it, but that D minor chord, instead of voicing it D, F, A, voice it D, A, so fifth higher, and then F. It'll also allow you to do some interesting things with your voice leading. So instead of just moving your chords like this, it'll allow you to move your chords like this, kind of opening and closing and opening and closing. Last thing is I would love to hear a snare in this. Snare is just a really affirming way of letting you know you can kind of lock into this beat. When we don't have snares, we're not 100% locked into the groove. And sometimes that can be used to your advantage. Like saving a snare for the very end of a piece is a really great way to kind of delay the climax of the piece. So I would love at the very end of the piece, you know, maybe drop the drums for a second and have it dun 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 and then finally hit that snare. It'll be a really rewarding uh, experience for your listeners because they'll finally get what they're what they're expecting to hear. So really great submission, thank you. Next up we have the piano scientist, and her submission is called Sunday Rain. Yeah, beautiful. Really nice job there. I like how you ended with that major seventh chord. Um, I think you should repeat it. Let me hear it one more time, actually. Nice repeat. Nice B section. Okay, I think there's opportunities for you to take um, a little bit more chords than your one, four, and five, because for the most part, you're kind of moving one, six, four, and five. The standard chords, totally fine. I think there's opportunities to reharmonize it as you go on, um, maybe even to use some borrowed chords. I was hearing like in your B section to create some secondary dominance. Secondary dominance means using uh, major five chords of other non-key center chords. So for example, you're in E flat, it sounds like. So maybe a secondary dominant chord would be like G major going to C minor. So it gives us the feeling that we're in a different key temporarily before we move back. Um, a lot of Chopin's music does that. It's a very, very common technique throughout all music, but it sounds like the kind of vibe you're going for is like a Chopin-esque vibe. So I would say, check out some of Chopin's music do an analysis of the chords that he does and see how he brings the chords in all these different directions so that the resolution back home is much more satisfying. The whole point of, you know, chords, harmony, reharmonization is storytelling. Um, in the same way that melody can tell stories, 
harmony can tell stories too. Certain chords can sound, um, you know, comforting. Certain chords can sound foreign. And the whole point is to kind of take your listener on this journey of the expected versus the unexpected. We start at home, we leave home, we return to home. It's something I talk about a lot to students um, in, during lessons with like improv, with composing, um, but that storytelling element is what's so unique and personal to each of us and allows us to forge our own voice because we all have a different take on the world and what it means to be happy or sad or in love or angry. And that is the voice that I encourage you to explore, not just with your melody, but with your harmony. See what it means for you to be unsure and then reassured and comforted and warmed, you know, all those different kind of emotions. It's fun to explore it through harmony as well as melody. But excellent submission, really beautiful, loved it. Our next submission comes from Tim and it's called A Sea of Ice. Nice, really nicely done. Um, I liked your melody. You have two kind of distinct mem melodies that are very memorable, um, and you've repeated them very nicely, so you've kind of committed to that melody, which is excellent. Um, I liked your colors in the beginning and at the end with those open fifths, those rolls and stuff, and your movement of fifths really gives a feeling of like iciness, as I think you're trying to convey. Um, I think there's a huge opportunity for you to play with inversions a lot, and here we go again, Zach. Stop talking about voicings. I can't stop talking about voicings and inversions because they're so important and have such power that I think people really don't realize. So as an example, I'd love to talk about your piece in front of the piano uh, and talk about some of the inversions and voicings. So my setup is down, so I'm doing this with my iPhone, so sorry if it's shaky, but let's take a look at your four chord progression here. You've got F minor, and then you've kind of got an E flat major, and then you've got a B flat major, and then you've got C minor. Now those are all closed position chords, meaning all of the notes are as close together as possible. So if I were doing it in three note um, triads, it'd be like. Now typically we don't like that kind of motion because we're jumping around a lot and it's not the best kind of voice leading we could have. The best voice leading would be where we have the least amount of movement between the notes as possible. So we would take our, maybe our F minor chord. Now we could still do this because everything's moving a step. Not perfect because a lot of things are moving in ways we don't like, like parallel fifths that I talked about. So what we could do is move, instead of this E flat like this, we could do the first inversion. Just moving all the notes up one step, so. Now that allows us to do our B flat major or to do our B flat major in the second inversion, meaning up two steps. So B flat, first inversion, second inversion. So now we have this, F, E flat, B flat, and then our C minor, we could do in first inversion. So C minor, C minor in first inversion. So all together we have, Now that's voice leading with closed position. Now we could do open position, which means we take the middle voicing and we move it up to the top. So we would have. So altogether we could do something like. And then do closed. You see the possibilities become really, really open when we start playing around with inversions and voicings in different ways. So instead of doing the whole time, we can vary it up a little bit.
Heck yeah. Hopefully that helps. You've got some really solid material here with your um, melodic ideas. Um, and the voicings are really just a way for you to be able to expand and create more of that storytelling element. So, thanks again for your submission, Tim. Next we have Tucker Larson called Never Before. Nicely done. Yeah, your piece had kind of like this nice arc that worked dynamically, which is uh, excellent. So you had this piece, you had some really nice syncopations in there, very interesting stuff with those triplets and dent, 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 and all that kind of jazz, which is really nice. I would recommend, and I know at this point now we've gone through 40 submissions, I'm, gonna, I'm bound to repeat myself, but I would recommend giving this to a pianist, or at least showing it. Um, and seeing what they think about some of those syncopations, because some of those things, very cool, especially when they're performed digitally, maybe a little bit harder to execute um, by a real musician, because that kind of accuracy that you're getting from your playback, you won't get, you likely won't get um, consistently with a real pianist. Maybe that's something you don't care about. I mean, I understand like things like Undertale, a lot of that music is tailored digitally, where it's supposed to be oh, near impossible to play. That's why Frank and I do it. But maybe just something to be aware of. Those syncopated patterns can be sometimes a little bit difficult for people. Uh, also, I'd be aware of your range. Um, I'm hearing some rolled chords and stuff while you have your patterns going on, and to me that's saying, okay, I'm hearing three distinct things, so this is probably intended to be a piano duet. Um, if I'm wrong, then just make sure that what you've written is playable, or go in with the intention that this is not intended to be a piece that's going to be played by a real musician. It's just a performance piece that's played on a digital piano, which is totally fine. Or, if you want to be a little more artsy, think about, well, a pianist has two hands and he's doing this and I want these rolled chords. Maybe just give it to another instrument. Give those brum, brum, brum to a harp or something like that, a guitar. Something that'll kind of make it feel a little bit more realistic with uh, what different musicians can accomplish. Also, in terms of register, Again, just make sure if you have your melody moving somewhere that you don't have chords that are overlapping directly on top of it. You want to keep those out of the way, um, which you're doing a pretty good job of. You have them mostly in the high end while the melody was there. Um, just something to be aware of if you weren't already. But nice submission, really, really cool ideas. And our last piece, the last piece of the composition submissions. So crazy. It's by Una Maduna, and it's called Challenger X. That's a cool finale. Um, really nice. I love your percussion writing. I thought that was really nice. You did some really cool things with your orchestration. Um, and it was interesting because your whole piece was really one melody. Um, and so you were varying up the orchestration as the melody was going on, which I thought was really nice. 
Um, a couple suggestions. Number one, I think your reverb tail is a little bit too long. Um, it's starting to muddy up some of your harmonies early on in the beginning of the piece. Um, I would make sure that your reverb tail for orchestral music isn't longer than three seconds, and three seconds is pretty long too. This is my personal preference, but I tend to go somewhere around two and a quarter seconds, just because I find that it gives it a nice tail without drowning out the sound. Also, I would find ways to vary it up. If you're going to do unisons, you might consider adding some harmonies in some places just to add some context to the melody. Um, melody without harmony, it's okay, but it loses context after a while. It starts to just feel like one wandering thing. Um, and so sometimes harmony can provide some emotional context, whether you want the thing to feel like a Darth Vader evil theme or if you want it to feel like something triumphant. There's a lot of ways that we can kind of change the context through harmony. Also with your percussion, I would suggest finding ways, as opposed to just reinforcing the melody, find ways to use percussion as a counterpoint um, to offer something different than the melody. The percussion section almost is like a melodic instrument in itself, even if it's not pitched it still has rhythmic power. And so we can use percussion as a way to offset some of the ideas presented in the melodic section. We're looking for gaps in the same way that we would look for gaps with a counterpoint melody. Um, and that makes it when they actually do align and play together, bum, 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 way more effective than having them play together the whole time. Also, I would study some orchestral mixing and just know that things like triangles are gonna be a lot more wet in the room than something like the strings because of the placement. We have triangles way in the back of the stage, and so they're going to generally be a little quieter and also a lot more buried in reverb. If you're using a notational software for your playback, then you might not have that kind of power of mixing, um, but it's just something to be aware of for your writing and also for if you ultimately decide to give this to a DAW like Logic or something like that, and you're going to do a more polished mix of it. Um, but really, really nice work. Great job. And ladies and gentlemen, that is going to do it for the composition submissions. We finally made it through them all. Oh, I made it through all of them. It was so much fun. I really enjoyed it. A ton of work. I'm not going to lie, but I really, really enjoyed listening to them all. And I hope you enjoyed. Uh, I so, hope I was able to help with some of the suggestions. They were so great. Such a variety of different submissions. So many different genres. It was a, really a blast. Um, if you saw my last... Uh, my last submission video, I've launched a Patreon so that hopefully we can fund these and maybe make more of them happen in the future. If you're interested in that, you can check them out. And maybe what I'll do is I'll have patrons who donate $5 or more be eligible for the next composition submission. The only reason why is just because they take so much time. I mean, each of these takes hours upon hours to, to make. And I just want to make sure that I'm able to balance these and my other projects at the same time. But I would love to do more and I hope you'll help me make that happen. So. That's going to do it. Keep an eye out in the next few days because I have a very, very important announcement coming up. Uh, and if you're on my Discord, you might know already. But if you're here, you might not. So stay tuned for it. Thank you all again for your submissions. See you in the next video.